forget you're carrying our child and you're over sensitive. I'll kill you and cry. You're stuck with me until you die. Shot her in the head? No, heart. She just went into a bag. Several bags? No, two. Just folded her. You know, adrenaline of strength of 10 men. She was dead. Her body went into a dumpster. I'm hoping the holiday and the rain will help at that landfill. That houses will be built over her by the time anyone realizes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Mr. Skinner and myself, we appreciate the time and attention that you all have given during the trial portion, which I know we are all on day six. It's been long, and it's been a lot before you all, and you all are going to be tasked with weighing the evidence that's been presented over the past six days, the law that your honor will instruct you after closing arguments, and I'll, I'll touch upon that in some of it during my closing, and then common sense. And that is when we are going to ask you all on something you heard all the way back just about 10 days ago. Hold on one second, stop. Again, this was brought up even during jury selection. Did a crime occur? Was the defendant the one who committed the crime? And again, we have talked about the law, the evidence, and using your common sense. Now, of course, that is simplified. And I'm about to go over the material elements, because I know Mr. Skinner had talked about that as well during jury selection, that every crime here in the state of Florida has elements, and that is what the state of Florida has to prove beyond every reasonable doubt are those elements, not additional elements, but those elements. And it also in this case, we have charged three crimes. So we're first gonna talk about date and venue. I know throughout the trial, you all heard, is that in Duval County, Florida? That is part of the state's requirement to prove that a case occurred here within this jurisdiction. So that is why you all kept hearing, is that in Duval County? That is why. We have two different venues. We are stating for counts one and two that the venue of the murder of Ayana and her unborn child was at Ace Pick Apart off of North Main Street. And I have put an image on you on the screen, which is state 67. Then I'm gonna show you some photographs a little bit later on. We believe and we are going to argue that the venue then for count three involving the sexual battery occurred at a defendant's residence. And I'll talk about that testimony. And that would have been during the time frame because it's different. So we have December 19th through 20th, 2018 for counts one and two. And count three, we have a larger range based upon the nature of the case, that chart, specifically the sexual battery that it occurred on or between, on, on one or more occasion during December 1st, 2017, and then up to December 20th, 2018. So that is why you all will see the different dates during your jury instructions. So roadmap, I'm just gonna briefly touch upon justifiable excusable homicide, and obviously we don't have attempted Sent to have inside this case, so I apologize for that one. I'm just gonna brush through it because it's a standard requirement in your jury instructions. And so I just wanna point it out, that's not the case in this, in this one today, ladies and gentlemen. You can look at it, but you can move on. 
Because I submit to you there is no evidence before you all to consider that the murder of Ayana and her unborn child was justified or excused. But again, it's part of the norm requirements, so that's why I always like to touch upon it. The elements of our crimes charged, lesser included crimes, and then the evidence that the state is going to argue, we believe shows the defendant is guilty of these crimes beyond a reasonable doubt. I apologize, it's the issue with the clicker. So again, when thinking about the evidence, what is not beyond a reasonable doubt? Speculative doubt, imaginary doubt, forced doubt, a mere possible doubt. Those are not reasonable. And if those start to occur, you need to wipe that away because that is not reasonable doubt. So again, I, I told you all that we would, can you go back just one, one, two, one, two minutes, thank you. So again, this is about the introduction where it's talking about the justifiable, the excusable, and again, I'm gonna go through this very quickly. I'm not reading this to you. Again, it's, an it's just to address, again, no evidence of justified or excused. You can just go next couple. All right, so we have three crimes charged before you all. And each verdict of each count should not affect the other one. Because we have brought before you three charges that involve the same set of facts. So each charge needs to be determined by you all independently of the other. And that is the reason why, and your honor will instruct you on this as well. Thank you, sir. So what does the state of Florida have to prove in murder in the first degree? So I'm just gonna to touch upon them, and then later on in the end of my presentation, I'm gonna show you how we have done that. And what I've done since counts one and two are identical except for element one, and that involves who is the victim alleged in that element. So element one, is IS dead? Is her unborn child dead? Was the death of IS and or her unborn child caused by the criminal acts of the defendant? Was there a premeditated killing of IS and her unborn child? Meaning that there was premeditated killing. Now, so in thinking about killing with premeditation, there is no time requirement in the state of Florida when your honor instructs you, it's not gonna say, has to be 10 minutes, has to be one month, has to be one year. It could be as simple as a snap of a finger. The person has to have the intent to kill at the time of the killing. But again, so I always wanna point that out because sometimes through watching TV, et cetera, just rely on the law that your honor provides. But there is no time requirement in the state of Florida. However, they have to have that intent at the time they kill. And again, this would be some further definitions. So if you all find that the defendant is guilty of count one and or two as charged, and also, some le also lesser included as well, uh, regarding a firearm, you would ask then at that point to make a further finding, meaning during the commission of that first degree murder, did the defendant actually possess and discharge a firearm? Actually possess and discharge a firearm with great bodily harm or death? Actually possess a firearm or did not possess a firearm? So that would be a further finding if you found as charged to murder in the first degree and you were actually asked to be do that as well under murder in the second degree, which is a lesser included crime of first degree. And there's another further finding under manslaughter, but we'll get to that. It's a tad different from the further finding if you get to that point, which we believe you all will under counts one and two. Again, 
Now, your honor is also going to instruct you, instruct you. You are, if you believe the state of Florida has proven beyond a reasonable doubt, it is to the highest crime that you all should find the defendant guilty for. So what are some of the lesser included here? So it's like a, it's like a building block. It's like that funnel. You start off with the lowest layer, and then the layer comes up like an op opposite triangle. Because when you start out with manslaughter, it's not to the same degree of elements. In fact, it's only two elements. It's a different degree of intent. And then you get to second degree. The difference between second degree murder and first degree murder is premeditation. So second degree murder does not require premeditation. So the element is the same as first degree murder, dead. Criminal act is the same, but again, it comes down to element three that's the difference. First degree murder, premeditation. And then in second degree murder, it talks about a depraved mind. Demonstrating a disregard for human life. So when an individual decides, I'm going, to, I'm going to shoot my gun in a crowd of individuals, not intending to kill one specific person, that could be second degree murder. Because I intentionally decided I was going to fire that gun. These are some definitions as well that your honor instructs you to help you in making your determination. And then like we're talking about that building block. Manslaughter is only two. Again, element one's the same, that the individual is dead. And then it's intentionally committed an act or acts that cause the death. Don't, does not require premeditation, does not require that depraved mind. And then the further finding, I, like I stated, is a, that's a tad different, but it's still involving the firearm. And that instance is whether the person carried, displayed, used, threatened to use a firearm if you all were to find that lesser included crime of manslaughter. Sexual battery. There are three elements in regards to sexual battery. That defendant engaged in any act that constituted sexual battery. Sexual battery is the sexual organ of the defendant penetrated or had union with the female genitals of IS. Go back just a second. Thank you. So in regards to this one, I submit to you two is easy. And, and why? It says IS was 12 years of age or older, younger than 18. There has been zero dispute that during the 2017 December to December 2018, she was of the age of 15 and 16 years old. Therefore, state has proven beyond reasonable doubt. There's no dispute about her age. Element three, again, I submit there is no dispute about element three, that the defendant was in a familial relationship with her. He was her uncle. So it comes down to, I submit you all, element one, whether you all believe that the state of Florida has proven beyond a reasonable doubt the sexual battery, the actual physical act of that penetration. Again, we'll talk about that later. Go ahead. You go ahead, I think there's three total. Thank you, sir. So again, these are some of the things that your honor is going to instruct you when you're thinking about the, the witnesses from the stand. Because you can believe all of someone's testimony, some of someone's testimony, or none. That is each of your province of being a fact finder on this jury. Talks about opportunity and no things. Accurate memory. Honest and straightforward with the attorney's questions. I think there's three as well. Thank you, Mr. Skinner. Interest in how the case should be decided. Does the testimony agree with other witnesses? Was there an inconsistent statement? So, there was a lot of witnesses that came before you all. I'm not going to stand up here and go through all of them. 
You all have had six days to think about what everyone has stated. You got plenty of time and then go back and think about also what they stated. But I just kind of wanted to break down who's actually been before you all the past six days. Well, family, Kimberly Mobley, Willie Sawyer, we got dad, we got mom, Juanella Haynes, maternal grandmother, Nancy Ware, paternal grandmother, S. Samaya Sawyer, SS, her sister. And then we got aunts, right? Jametta Mobley, Margie Mobley, and then we know Naomi Mobley, ex-wife of the defendant, and also aunt to IS. We've, we had some friends called. As you all learned, that IS had a very close knit of friends, either from elementary school or middle school. Because again, she was only IS, a 10th grader, at the time that this happened. Work-related, we have, of course, the Ace Pickup Park situation with Jonathan Lindros, Gary Lindros. We've got Billy Brown with All-American Garbage at the time. We have Ed Schmalfeld with the Otis Road Landfill that we'll talk about. Then we had a series of law enforcement. We had Detective Abbott, the lead homicide detective. We had Detective Litter Lillard at the time, the lead crime scene detective. Detective Lane, who did the Don Quay and the Parsley from IS and SS bedroom on India Avenue. Detective Savage, who did the swabbing of those bottles. Detective Bidlick, who was a part of the homicide team that conducted this investigation. And he was the one tasked with putting the wire on and getting that situated with Morris McClendon. Detective Hamilton, she had gone to two different locations. She had gone to Ace Pick Apart to look at that GMC envoy. She also went to the defendant's residence at Trout River Road to get that nine millimeter firearm. Detective King, he came in from Ocala with his canine, Knox, and he went to Ace Pick Apart. He also went to the landfill several days as well and told us about that and the alerts that Knox had, and we saw photographs as well. Detective Quintana, he was to, he, the purpose of him, ladies and gentlemen, obviously was very brief when he took the stand, but it was important that we got the state of Florida get this information out, that when they get records from a company and they put these records on these platforms like Cellbrite, Oxygen, that those records are not altered. That's important. They're not changed. They are as is at the time the data is received and downloaded. Officer Harris, she was with the Duval County School Board Police. She was the one that assisted um, with the video surveillance and looking into if anyone has seen or talked to her talked to IS from school when she went that fateful day in December 19th, almost five years ago. And then we have Detective Porter. She's the one that commits the JSO aspect of missing persons investigation on December 21st and all the actions that she did. Experts, you heard from Nicholas Kutu regarding the DNA efforts made by J JSO. You heard from Dr. Thomas how she had done a sexual assault kit with IS. The irony of that, ladies and gentlemen, that that would be reported in March 2018 involving a neighbor who was 20. And then DNA results just so happen to come back to the defendant and her interior crotch panties. What a surprise. Put it in for a 20-year-old, and we get back a 30-something-year-old who's your uncle. The irony. And another thing we also heard that was interesting from Dr. Thomas is that potential injury to the hymen, indicative of prior sexual activity. And then we heard from Laura Draga, just again to state that the fire operated, and she also made a noteworthy. The fire was extremely oily, consistent with overcleaning. Yeah. 
And then you heard from Dr. Achu. She was the one that met with IS on December 13th, 2018. And that's when the bomb was about to explode because there were no more secrets. There were no more hiding. The IS was in fact pregnant. And not just pregnant, but five months. It's on. Who's that father? Then we heard about confessions. We'll get into those. Damien Hatch, an inmate. George Jackson, inmate. Cousins with Morris McClendon. And then obviously the defendant's brother, Joseph Quiles. We heard from a bunch of different people regarding records. Nicole Phillips with Navy Federal Credit Union. Jack Brown with Chick-fil-A. Anthony Knitch with Verizon. Ryan Nestor with the, the well, it's public safety analyst supervisor. Barbara Johnson, who was with the owner of Gun Gallery back at that time. Susan Johnson, the T-Mobile records. And then we heard this morning, actually, from a couple of defense witnesses. So we heard from Kamar Humphrey. Again, Kamar Humphrey was the neighbor. He had sex with IS when she was 15. State of Florida, someone under the age of 16, not equal to, but under the age, cannot consent with someone over the age of 20, equal to 24 and over. And that's what we had here with Kamar Humphrey. We had a 20 year old and a 15 year old, and it was illegal. And Ms. Mobley called. Again, following through and protecting, trying to protect her daughter. I submit to you that <coughs> Mr. Humphrey was afraid during that deposition, thinking it was going in some way, make him be criminally liable again. There's been zero evidence put before you all, zero. I submit to you that that would be speculative, forced, imaginary, or mere possible, which all four are not beyond a reasonable doubt. Zero evidence that Kamar Humphrey is involved in this case. And Carol Clip, a good Samaritan, trying to help. And thankfully we have people like that in our community. But I submit to you all that seeing someone almost at nighttime while you're driving for five to seven seconds, she was just mistaken, but trying to help. Ulysses Dixon, he's a five-time convicted felon. He's known defendant now for several years and he has 13 pending charges. And it's just a coincidence, he's charged with human trafficking and sexual battery. So I submit to you all, again, it's up to you all to find if you believe him to be credible or not. Now, physical evidence, we've gone over the witnesses a little bit. We've got the firearm, we've got crime scene photographs, we've got video surveillance from Terry Parker, Cell phone records, either from T-Mobile, Verizon, because we never were able to get IS's phone, as was told to Joseph Quiles, the defendant threw it in a body of water. But we were able to get the defendant's phone and do what's called a cell dump. The Ace Pick Apart video, her bank records, Snapchat records, Google location data of the defendant, the Don Quay and the Parsley pills. The khaki bra that Miss Mobley identified. The pink bra that Miss Mobley and SS identified. The lips panties that was identified. The Terry Parker book. Now, it's true, ladies and gentlemen. We cannot say 100% that that book came from IS because there was no record at Terry Parker who took that out. And Ms. M no witnesses stated, I know for a fact. This, but it was a coincidence. Out of all the high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, all of Duval County, it's a book from Terry Parker High School, the same school where IS was last seen. We've got the rain suit. We've got the sexual assault kit, the Amazon purchase records, the defendant's timesheet, the DNA from that sex kit, and then the wire. Now, this is just an image from States 25, 
Sadly, this is the last time at approximately 11 a.m. on 12-19-2018 that she is seen alive. And we know by looking at that, again, if you see something different, ladies and gentlemen, in any of these photographs, any of those video surveillance, you rely on what you believe you see, if it's different from what I am stating and arguing to you all. She's on the phone. That call, I submit to you all, is not on her Verizon records. And what did we hear from Mr. Konech? You can go to a third-party app and make a call on that app and it not show up on the Verizon records. Now, I submit to you all that shows the, that shows the planning. Don't want to be tracked. Why else? Use a third-party app when you have a phone. That planning had commenced before she made that phone call, before she left school. The van. This is the van that the defendant was driving during this time frame. This is the van that would fit all the kids. This is State's 21 composite. This is the van that the defendant was driving the day IS went missing. This is the van that had been used to take them to the beach, et cetera. And oddly enough, that van gets sold nine days later, when that's the vehicle that your family uses the most. Now I agree, and we concede, and we understand that vehicle was processed. Detective Abbott found it. He got his crime scene detective there. They went there. They processed it, and they found nothing. But again, I submit to you the timing. Talk about coincidence. All right. Uh, unfortunately, we're approaching the top there. We need a commercial break, but uh, we are going to pick it up right where we left off with the prosecution's closing argument. Is this jury going to buy it? Uh, stick with us. We'll be right back after this. Stay with us. Welcome back to Core TV Live. I'm Julia Janae here with Ted Rollins, and we're bringing you closing arguments in Florida in the murder trial against Jonathan Keyless. But before we get you back into court, we do have some breaking news out of California. Yeah, uh, the state and defense both rested in the uh, Hollywood obsession murder trial. Gareth Perthouse accused of murder and burglary and the death of uh, Amy Harwick. Prosecutors claim, of course, that uh, he hid inside her house, attacked her, killed her uh, when she returned home. No witnesses from the defense. All, uh, basically, it's all in closing arguments now set for next Tuesday. Jury has the day off and uh, Monday as well tomorrow. All right, so we're going to get you back into closing arguments in Florida in the pregnant niece murder trial. Gilles is accused of murdering his pregnant 16-year-old niece, Ayanna Sawyer, in 2018. And prosecutors say the child that she was carrying was the defendant's and that he killed her, put her body in a dumpster at his job location. Her body's never been found. The defense claims there's no evidence she's even dead, let alone linking the defendant to her death. Let's go back, pick it up where we left off. Those coincidences aren't just coincidences. We talked about the venue in regards to count three. These, this is our venue locations on our 16th Street and Trout River Road, where the defendant had lived with his ex-wife, Naomi, during the 2017 and 2018 timeframe. And next, I believe, yeah, this is just a screenshot. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the ACE video. You heard that the ACE video is approximately anywhere from four to five hours off. Do not know exactly if it's four, or 15, or 30, or 45, or five. But we believe comfortably that it's between the four and five. So if we see that 1253.30, that means it's anywhere from 7.53 a.m., 8.53 a.m. that the defendant is arriving at work on 12 19 18. And what I did, ladies and gentlemen, Santa Florida had shown during its case in chief part of a merge document to kind of get an understanding. However, 
Within that same exhibit is the actual individual clips that have the time. So as indicated on my PowerPoint is the time associated with this clip, which is 1253.30. And this clip is a Channel 8 uh, video. So the next thing we know, and if you'll help put one more time, thank you, sir. We're I'm now playing 15-17-41. So we are now approximately between 10-17 a.m. and 11-17 a.m. And we see the defendant leaving. Even though he had told Detective Abbott, I never left work that day. Even though he put on his timesheet, that indicates I never left that day. And just happens to be during the time frame that I asked leave school. Again, coincidences adding up. And two, the reason why I was saying about the four to five, because what we know for sure, this is the correct time on the Google location data where the defendant, if you'll hit, if you'll hit play, sir, thank you. We know that between 11.15 and 11.39, that the defendant is going to that parts store location near the airport. And you also heard from Detective Abbott that he, he drove these locations. He said it was approximately, depending on traffic, between a seven and eight minute drive one way from around Ace Pick Apart to the parts store. And then he had stated as well that it was like a 38 minute trip, round trip from Terry Parker High School to the area of Terry Parker. And then he stated that that parts store to Terry Parker High School was approximately 18 minutes one way. Another thing we heard about this is that when the almost 11.40, it's, it's 11.39 and some, and some milliseconds after that, that GPS goes off. As you heard from Ryan Nestor, doesn't come back on until 4.04 p.m. the next day again. A coincidence? I submit no. Because you know what also we heard? We heard from Naomi Mowgli, defendant's wife. She said, I went back and looked. We always share locations. During that same time frame, he had turned it off. Again, coincidence, I submit now. Next one. So thinking about time, just even in reference to what the actual video shows, at 15, 17 and some seconds, the defendant leaves. And we, and we only have a video of that 25 minute time frame. Well, the defendant comes back at 16.30. It's gone an hour and 13 minutes. You can hit play. And also, again, make your own observation. By submit to the defendant drives back. He drives back in that new area that Ace Pickup Part has acquired, where that was the old concrete factory where there's no video surveillance. We submit to you, that is when he takes IS back there. Again, he's gone for an hour and 17 minutes, and that GPS Google data only, only is for 25. So we have 52 more minutes. Another thing we heard that's important about this time frame, Naomi probably stated, the defendant didn't come home. I didn't go up there to bring him lunch, and he didn't come home. 52 minutes. Again, coincidence? No. Now, can we hit play? Thank you, sir. The defendant then is back in that area where you've heard from the Lendroses. He's not allowed to drive his vehicle back there. I mean, he works back there, but can't drive his vehicle back there. Now we see him finally coming out from that area with no camera surveillance. Go ahead, the next clip. Three minutes and 39 seconds, approximately, is how long he is back in that prohibited area of his vehicle. 
Go ahead, sir. Now, at 1846, so again, if we're doing our math, that would be 6 p.m. when we take off the military time, minus the 4, it's around 246. If we do the 5, 146. So sometime between 146 and 246, again, the defendant is getting duct tape. Duct tape. Jonathan Lindros was asked, is that something normal for you to have a task to work with? Jonathan Lindros said, no, it's not. And another thing I want to point out to you all, again, if you hear something different, in the wire, defendants asked, were there strings on the bags? The defendant said, no. Therefore, submit to you all a way to get those bags to stay shut, since they have no strings, is duct tape. Now, we know that at the end of the day, the defendant leaves at the 2206 44 second mark that's indicated. So that would either, again, be around the five o'clock area or the six o'clock area between those two time frames. We know that he comes back to Ace Pick Apart at 1244.01. And I know that Mr. Lindros had felt more confident with this date probably being closer to the five hour minus time frame. So that would be 744 approximately in the morning. Now another thing I just wanted to point out to you all, again, these coincidences. In the 121918 video, the defendant has braids. Naomi, Naomi Mobley has stated that he would wear his hair in braids, or he also would wear his hair with no braids. But I submit to you that in 121918, the defendant's wearing braids. However, in 122018, no braids. Coincidence? I submit no. Now, another thing in regards to the video comparisons of 1219 and 1220. And again, 1220, it is raining. It's raining a lot, it's pretty heavy. And on this particular day, the only time, and this is also for 1219, the only time the defendant is seen bring a vehicle from one side where that concrete factory area to the area by the pressure, the area by the container. It's only one time. And that one time, it's not long before the container arrives. Coincidence? No. That's 1852. Again, it appears to be an older maroon four-door sedan. Go ahead, the next one, please. And then, at some point, too, during that day, the defendant gets another rain suit. So to you, that's odd. He has a rain suit on. But again, another thing, coincidence? Submit no. And that was just early in the day, and I apologize, it's a little bit out of, out of tune for time, timing purposes. Then, if you'll have play, Mr. Skinner. At 1852.53, and I'm going to show you all, it's hard to see in this video, and it's covered by parts, however, there is a red blurb right under this red car. That is the edge of the container. I just wanted to point that out. And in the 1852-53, we're looking at camera angle 11. And in this angle, I submit to you all, this is then where we see the defendant bringing that sedan to the area of the container 
and the car crusher. You'll go to the next one, please. Now, about another eight to 10 minutes later, the defendant is now in his front loader. Again, he's changed out the forks for the bucket. And Jonathan Lindros even kind of stated, I'm not really sure why he's getting the bucket. Well, in thinking about this at the 1902 approximate time frame, the bucket is actually up. It's not facing forward. So I submit to you, there's something inside that bucket. And this happens shortly after the car is taken. The only car taken in that two-day time frame. Then, in the next clip, approximate same time frame, at 11, I just did a screenshot, there's video of it, it's taken to the container. And yes, it's the only container on the property, but there's other garbage receptacles closer by. However, this is taken straight to the container. After the container, the bucket, I submit to you all again, you can look at it, is downward. It's not upward. Now, in 1908-34, this is where we submit the All-American Garbage has arrived. The defendant is in his front loader, and he goes straight to him. Now, this is after he's brought the car over. This is after he's brought something over in the dumps and in the bucket. And I submit to you again that he is actually not walking, but in a hurry to get to that driver. We can move on. Now submit to you, you'll see him get back in, and then next, he then will take him to the location of where the container is to swap them out. I submit in the 12, first one is a screenshot from 1912-52, where again, if you look closely, you can see the, t the red container coming down out an angle to, be, to actually slide off. You can see that in the video. And then the All-American is clearly displayed at the 1921-05 time frame, exiting the property. Camera view five at 1921-32. Do you have, is it? The All-American container is seen exiting the property. And it's the this prosecutor is doing such a good job precisely going through the evidence visually for these jurors about what happened. We do have to squeeze in a break, but we'll get you right back in for more of those closing arguments when we come back. Tonight on Closing Arguments, an in-depth profile of the accused killer in the Delphi murder case. What we know about Richard Allen and what his defense team is now saying about the investigation. And the civil trial begins today in the case at the center of the popular Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. We'll bring you the biggest moments from opening statements as this trial gets underway. Closing Arguments with Vinny Politan, tonight at 8, 7 Central, only on Court TV. Closing arguments are underway in the pregnant niece murder trial for Jonathan Quillis. Facing murder charges after prosecutors claim he shot and killed his niece to hide. The fact that she was pregnant with his child, she was only 16 years old. Her body's never been found. And what they're talking about right now in court, the, the state is showing the uh, video in their closings of the surveillance at his job, which is where they say Ayanna Sawyer was killed. Let's go back in right where we left off. was when we saw All-American Container leaving. Huh. 24 minutes later, who do we see leaving? Will you hit play, sir? However, he doesn't go straight out. He goes back. 
Smitchy's going back to make sure got everything taken care of. Nothing left. And then what do we learn? We learn that he goes to the gun gallery where his ex-wife had identified his signature and it's on line 10. Now, something else that was kind of interesting about the gun gallery. This is when the next time the GPS Google location data comes up. But what also did we hear? We heard from his ex-wife, they always go to the gun range. So I submit to you, is it a coincidence that you're putting in GPS when you always go somewhere? I submit to you, what you know, the address? Again, coincidence? No. The defendant talks about going to the gun gallery in the wire to his brother. Somehow thinking if they can figure out this gun's been shot recently, well then I can just, I submit to you, our argument is, I went to the gun gallery. I just shot it. You see, you saw my Google location data. I went there. Again, coincidence. Part of the plan. Timesheet. Another not coincidence. That ace video refutes that timesheet. Refutes what he told Detective Abbott back in December of 2018 when he first met him. Refuse. Well, the next question would be, well, why did he then go to a parts store? I submit to you plan B. They find out that I leave. I went to a parts store. Mr. Lenders asked me to go. But then it still doesn't add up. Because we still have 52 minutes unaccounted for with no location data that's been taken off. The gun. The defendant says in the wire, I used the gun at my house. The police haven't even gone and get it. He even says it's a nine millimeter firearm. Please go to the house, do a search warrant. They get it. So we submit to you this is our murder weapon. Now the landfill, yes, it was a lot. But that's what JSO did. They were 16 grueling days at that landfill. Did they find her remains? No. But what did we hear? What did we see? And just so you know, the, the picture on the left is from day one. The picture on the right is from day 16. What was it? Over 5,500 tons. They so went through. But again, needle on a haystack looking for her. We saw the vultures, indicative of remain. We had the canine out there, Knox, or learning as well. Again, needle in a haystack. Okay. We did find some items, again, we talked about the Terry Parker book. We had the pink bra identified, the lip panties identified, and then we also saw, found some paperwork from Ace Pickle Park during that time frame. Snapchat messages. Let's talk, let's, let's, I just wanted to point out some of those to you all. Again, we submit those messages are from the defendant and IS. And that IS saved those messages. She was the owner of both accounts. Again, because this is a secret. This is, a, this is an underage relationship with a niece. This is not something that is wanting to be known. In fact, IS lied until the day she died for him. And what did he do in return? He killed her for her loyalty and love. I'm too jealous with you. I couldn't even sleep last night. I need to separate myself from you. 
Not yet, I need to calm down. And I put the dates beside them, August 3rd. You know what, I'm going to piece of dick in the AM and cut all ties with you completely. August 7th, 2018. You all and I was getting a divorce and you and I, once you hit 18, was going to break out, August 7th. I'm not going to have you stay the night anymore. Anyway, so whatever you really did this time, August 7th, 2018, and we know the IS was over there all the time based upon all the testimony. I love you too. We can't risk your future. I promise I'll give you two kids, but you need to finish up college so you can be very successful in life. That's August 14th. You just make it all so easy for me to just leave you alone. Goodbye, Yana. Just like he did between December 19th and December 20th. I think you should take the bus back home from now on. Again, we heard that the defendant would go to that school, pick her up, pick up SS, and then his son when he came and that's what we heard from Haley, Chipper. She had seen the defendant's van there before. And that's what we're hearing right here as well. You seem to have it all figured out. That's August 20th. I don't like nobody hurting you but me. Hmm. Who do we also hear that the defendant was quite selfish from? Oh, and that text message from the defendant's phone from Joseph Piles about the selfishness of his brother. Need a break, back with more. Right after this, stay with us. That on closing arguments, an in-depth profile of the accused killer in the Delphi murder case. What we know about Richard Allen and what his defense team is now saying about the investigation. And the civil trial begins today in the case at the center of the popular Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. We'll bring you the biggest moments from opening statements as this trial gets underway. Closing arguments with Vinnie Politan tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Welcome back. We're watching the uh, closing arguments in the pregnant niece murder trial. And uh, so far, it is very compelling from the state of Florida. That's right. And we are expecting them to go about two and a half hours. So we are hitting the pause button there inside of the courtroom. We're going to bring in for this hour criminal defense attorney Francis Johnson, who's standing by in Statesboro, Georgia. Francis, this is a pretty compelling closing argument from the state. Do you think there will be a problem on appeal with them being able to bring in not only these allegations of murder, but also the sexual battery against this young girl? You know, that's always uh, problematic, and we've seen other cases uh, that have been covered here on this network uh, where that has been, been the case. It raised some concerns with me, but you have to give it to this prosecutor for going through methodically, building the case, and closing all areas of doubt especially regarding this defendant, this this just the sick human being who uh, has admitted to uh, molesting and raping uh, his niece and uh, is charged with her murder, gruesomely throwing her body away like it was garbage. Uh, this is just a, a real sad, sad story. Without that component, do you think the, I mean, it seems like they have a legit chance of getting a guilty verdict on the murder, even though you don't have the body, you're not, sure the crime scene no murder weapon but just the way even they're delivering this clothes with the imagery and the you know the the front loader with uh, it up and you just picture the body in there i mean it's it is very compelling but without that he's a disgusting human being element which they were able to be brought in would would we be buying the bodies in the front loader as easily, or did they need that to get the murder conviction? Yeah, I think it's fundamental to the intent. Uh, it did transform him, transforms him from an uncle. I'm an uncle who loves his nieces to a predator who had uh, motive, which is not necessarily an element of the crime, but the intent to kill her uh, to make sure that uh, their secret never got out. She was pregnant with his baby. He did not want that to get out. And he uh, 
he destroyed her life uh, as a result of it. That's what it appears from all the evidence we've heard, including uh, informant in the jailhouse who snitched on him. Yeah, the motive in this case seems to be really clear. We're going to get everyone back inside of that courtroom. They've been reading off some of those text messages, Snapchat messages between the defendant and the victim. Some of them have explicit language on them. So that's why you're seeing the seal up. Let's go in right where we left off. You're hearing our child and you're over sensitive. I do love you very much and don't want you to keep going through this drama, but we have plans, and if you act off your emotions, you will hinder our plans in the future. If that doesn't predicate why we're here today, IS hindered the defendant's plans by not having an abortion. It's very hard to see it now, but it's the truth from August 22nd. Again, for only purposes for count one and two motive, intent, plan, opportunity, absent mistake for count three, and then motive only for count one and two. He also admits to Maya. Now, there's a thing that could potentially, well, when we listen to the wire, the defendant says 100%, I never messed with SS. Well, I submit to you, that's because she, he's not gonna admit to that because she's alive. He's admitting to IS because he thinks he's going to get away with it because he thinks that there's no evidence. He even says that they got nothing on me. They gonna find that body. So I submit to you that he lied about SS because she's alive. She's still around. IS is not. That was that was August the 23rd. August 26th. LOL. You will be my best friend when you're pregnant. I'll cook for you until you can't eat no more. Again, what do we hear from Naomi, his ex-wife, about the cooking? More cooperation. Next, please. I've been kicked down there so much, I'm not sure how you're even pregnant from August 29th. So that's interesting. By the end of August, the defendant already knew she was pregnant. As we know, the family doesn't find out till December. August. There's still time for that abortion. Yeah, so I need you to be like 100% with me at all times. I'm just so in love with you. Hmm. I'll kill you and cry. That's from three months before she's killed. You're stuck with me until you die. How prophetic. Because IS was. She was stuck with him until her final days on this earth. I love you way too much to let you go, so you're not going to have no life. And she doesn't. Now, in going in to just highlight a few of the things of The Wire, I know it was two hours long, that's why I just wanted to point out a few things. She was 16 when she came out that she was pregnant. It was a possibility that was mine, you know. They already was accusing me of it. Yeah, she was, got shot. There ain't no ballistics, no. It was just a, it was a, that I got. Everything's clean, no nothing. I went to the gun range the same day. Taurus, a nine millimeter. It was a roller dumpster. That's, that's all they got over there as far for garbage. 40 yard, and that's what we heard, is a 40, 40 yard container. Next one. If she had gave birth to that baby, I've been sitting right here with y'all. Adrenaline give you the strength of 10 men. So the same day she went missing, the same day you dumped her? Well, no, it wasn't. It was, um, it would be the next day. So where are the, the F you had? You have her the first day. She was, she was dead, man. She was dead. It's loud over where I work at. And this was, I submit, in reference to the gunshot and the noise. Again, part of the planning, part of the preparation, part of that premeditation. You did say you were in the yard. Yeah, and I submit to you, that's in reference to where he shot her. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, is there some discrepancy in, was it in, a, in the car? 
Was it outside the car? Yes, it is, but it doesn't change where he's at ultimately, which is Ace pick apart in a secluded location. Was her, her name was Ayana. A unique name. She was actually scholarship. She was fixing to graduate two years early and go to college. As you heard from Naomi, she was the one that they thought could be president. You think they'll give you... Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I thought I heard something. You think they'll give you the needle? Well, one, that premeditated murder. Two, um, a young adult with an unborn child that was in five months. So they can consider it as like two. But the, the only thing that I might have on my side is due to the accumulation of garbage. And he's, he's talking about how, well, selfish me. Thank goodness it's the holiday season, so I can get away with this murder even more. This is the holiday. And then with all the rain that we had within those days. You know what I'm saying? Shot her in the head, no. Art. Yeah, she was dead. She just went into a bath. You poured some water where the blood was? Yeah, no. It's just, uh, it's dirt. You just scoop it up. I can move it. Scoop it up. Y'all fixing to run away? Yeah. You faking it? Yeah. Boy, you, and then Smith the defense says, lime boy. And shit. Again, with that planning, that premeditation, using that authority over her, that manipulation over her, that is clearly seen in those Snapchat messages, the mental abuse that he has over her, a juvenile. It's your wife's sister's kid? Yeah. She was my little baby. Yeah, been effing how long? Probably maybe a year, or probably less than a year. My theory behind it is that since I had no connection to anything, she can sit there for a whole effing year, and they'll build houses on top of that. That's how the defendant sees his niece. Shit. Now, in regards to the brother, his biological brother, we know that there was four calls on December 20 based upon the records. He was nervous, panicking, concerned, something I need to do. What is he going to do with the young lady? It's going to ruin his family. The young lady is pregnant. It's we have to hit a break. We will get you back inside of that courtroom for more closing arguments in just a moment. Stay with us. all my life. I learned the secret to success is speaking in your authentic voice. And I bring that lesson to my show every morning. Opening statements with Julie Grant. Weekday mornings at 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. And welcome back to Court TV Live. We are following the case in Florida where there are closing arguments right now for the pregnant niece murder trial for defendant Jonathan Keyless. He, of course, faces the potential of the death penalty if he's convicted of murdering his pregnant 16-year-old niece, Ayanna Sawyer. All right, now those prosecutor closing arguments are going on. We, you haven't missed a moment of it. We hit the pause button. We'll get you back into court right now where we left off. The next call is, took care of that. Had her in the vehicle, strangle her, couldn't stomach it, shot her in the chest. What's also in the chest, the heart. Had her in the, excuse me, discarded her body and then transported in that dumpster. Go next. Destroy the vehicle she was in. Well, what did we see in the video surveillance? We saw, we saw one vehicle, 19 to the 20th, being taken by the defendant to the crusher. Shot her in the car, in the chest. She came there on the premises that they were going to run away together and be a couple. That manipulation, that love, 
that loyalty, taking that secret to her grave. How the defendant repaid her. Wrapped her in a carpet, used machinery to do it. Oh, that front loader, front and center on that video surveillance. Knew the dumpster was going to be picked up, which it was. Would lose his entire family, his baby was born. Because what do we all see here about Naomi? From Naomi, but all his children look just like him. All. And then went to the shooting range. Planning it for months. Months. She wouldn't have that abortion, I submit to you all. That's one of the reasons why I asked Nichols Q2. Did you do fetal remains? You do DNA on paternity? And he said they could. And she wouldn't get that abortion. The defendant was left with the choice of killing her and destroying that evidence. Put her phone in the neighboring water. Try to speak with his brother, see if he changed his story. The brother wouldn't speak to him, so that's when he made the decision to call. Why told? Does not tolerate abusing children and women. So just kind of getting closer to wrapping up, we also heard about the Don Quay and the parsley that the defendant had given these as to IS and SS. And then Detective Abbott was able to dig into that. He didn't just take the word of Ms. Mobley, I-S-S-S. He reached out to, to Ms. Mobley and said, hey, you just check some accounts to see? October of 2017, lo and behold, Parsley and Donque. And lo and behold, what do we hear? Because you miscarriages. Now, this is just more specifically in how we proved, and again, coming down here to the wire, Element one, again, element one is the same except for which victim. IS is count one, unborn child is count two. Death. So the reason why the family was called, ladies and gentlemen, and that was to show her world was done. Mom, dad, grandparents, aunts, sister. Nobody has heard from her since she left the high school at 11 a.m. and 11 on 12 19. Friends, she's a teenager. Teenagers talk to their friends. That's, the, that's their life usually at that time, is their friend. She never returned to school. She never used another bank charge. She never had another phone communication. She never picked up her checks. Over $150 and it's right before Christmas, a teenager? And then the emissions to the brother, the emissions to the wire, emissions to the house. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, we are submitting, we have proven beyond a reasonable doubt, based upon that evidence and the exhibits that corroborate, that IS is not with us. She is dead. And in the defendant's own words, she was dead. Next one. Death was caused with a criminal act. He said he shot her, couldn't stumble it. He was at work, said no cameras. The activities at work regarding the forklift, um, getting the duct tape, lying about leaving work, turning off the GPS data location between those fateful time frames of 1219 and 1220. Cell phone records, his cell dump, he deleted his records from December 2016 through December 20th. Coincidence? No. Container, the landfill, the video from A's, the timesheet. He didn't go home that day. His actions, because what did Naomi Mobley also tell us? Before IS went, went missing on that 12 night he was fidgety, he was nervous, he was restless, he wasn't getting sleep because he knew she wasn't having an abortion. Because think about that short time frame. He's known since August that she's pregnant. Mom finds out December 3rd. Family finds out December 6th. Accusations by aunt comes December 6th. Baby's confirmed December 13th. And then Ayana is killed six days later. 
The pressure was on. She turned her phone off. Brother wire hatch Snapchat messages. We submit this shows that he shot her and what he did with her and why he did it. Now, might be a question. I'll just go ahead and just address this very quickly. Well, we don't know if he was the father of the child. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter. There's not one element under murder in the first degree that says we have to provide by DNA that the defendant was the father. That's not one of those elements. Because if we even think about the defendant's own words, it was the chance alone that the defendant killed. The chance alone. So it doesn't matter if that child ultimately was or was not, we submit to it was, but it doesn't matter. That's not one of the elements. And in the defendant's own eyes and own thoughts, his own statements, the chance alone had him commit pre-planned, premeditated murder for his own selfishness so he would not get caught. Next one. And the last one, the premeditation, again, We've heard planning about a month. We've heard planning months, pressure on the family. Tricked her to come to work. Would kill, said he would even kill in Snapchat. The dates, I already talked about the third, the sixth. Hughes, the baby confirmed, not getting an abortion. The emissions, the Snapchat. Now, in regards to the sexual battery, encourage or entice her to have sex. Well, she's pregnant. Common sense lets you know how a pregnancy occurs. We have Snapchat messages where he talks about didn't even, I've been hit so many times down there. You're, you're carrying our child. You've heard SS state it was the defendant too. You've heard the defendant admit that about the sex and the wire and to his brother as well and to Hatch. The DNA, the hymen, the limited purposes of SS and ID. All right, we uh, need to slip in a commercial break before the top of the hour, but uh, we're not going to miss any of the state's clothes in the defense. Well, what's the defense going to say? What can they say at yeah, this point? I'm interested there. to see. A lot there. <laughs> and they said to the judge they're not going to go along. That might change after listening to uh, the, uh, the states. Absolutely. We will see. Don't go anywhere. This is Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Row 3. Welcome back to Core TV Live. I'm Julia Janae. Thanks so much for following along with us this afternoon. We are watching the closing arguments that are already underway in the pregnant niece murder trial. The defense rested earlier today after calling three witnesses to the stand. You see them there. In the middle, a woman who reported seeing the victim, Ayanna Sawyer, after she had been reported missing. Also, a former neighbor on the left who testified that he had a sexual relationship with the teen when he was 25 years old. And on the right, there was an inmate who said that the state's inmate doesn't necessarily know what they are talking about in their communication with this defendant. The defendant, Jonathan Quillis, did not take the stand in his own defense. So right now we're in closing arguments. Let's get you back into court where the prosecution is delivering the end of their beginning part of the closings. Remember, Quillis is accused of getting his 16-year-old niece pregnant and then killing her her and her unborn child back in December of 2018. The grooming, like he had told ID. Oh, are you a, she's the new girl on the block. She just came into the picture in 2017. New niece on the block. I've already had two nieces. So are you a virgin? Oh, you sure are pretty. Oh, you know how to put a condom on? I suppose you can get further with IG because she didn't allow it. That's the difference. She was older, more mature, different personality, and a 13-year-old. All right, next. And at the time, again, so this was another easy one. We talked about um, age, her date of birth. We heard from mom and sister that um, she was, thank you. That, that she was under the age of, it should be 18, I apologize. That should be 18, that's my bad, but we rely on from the law from your honor. She was under the age of 18 at the time. Apologize for that error, it's a big error. 
Again, the limited purposes, again, for, and I'll just touch upon this, is the sexual abuse of SS and ID it for count one and two motive, and count three motive, intent, plan, opportunity, absence, mistake, or accident. Okay, next. Now, did a crime occur, and did the defendant commit the crime? I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, after hearing all this evidence and seeing all the exhibits, yes, the defendant not only committed one crime, but three. And we, I had talked about an opening, how there was going to be a lot of different pieces in this case. And after all these pieces were put together, there was going to be a picture. So let's look at those pieces. The DNA from the crotch and the panties. The third confession that was made to Damien Hatch. The second confession that was made in the wire. The Sister Samai, because she sadly was there during one of the defendant's sexual abuse acts on her sister. And also saw different various forms of kissing and touching and groping. She's pregnant. Came from having sex. Cell phone records again. Deleted data, turned off location. Go ahead. Ayana as well, too, turning off her phone. The Snapchat messages. Confirming the relationship, the sex, the nature of the father. Go ahead. The gun. Got that. The donque and the parsley, again. Not wanting to obviously get an underage niece pregnant. A's video that contradicts the defendant leaving, but corroborates the defendant's omissions. Google location. The defendant leaves, but we still got 52 minutes unaccounted for. And lastly, what started it all, his brother, Joseph Kelius. So ladies and gentlemen, we go to the next one. We're asking you, for Ayana and the unborn child who is going to be named Hazel to find the defendant guilty of premeditated first degree murder of IS, she was pregnant with his child, or the chance of being the child, his, the father of the child. And then also for the unborn child. And we submit to you that the evidence before you is beyond a reasonable doubt that the sexual battery as well regarding all the evidence and find him guilty as charged to all three counts. Thank you all. <clears throat> Members of the jury, I, I told you I'd give you a break. At the conclusion of the state's first close, I'll do so. It's 1.31. Um, is 20 minutes enough time? 